The Al sermon text is going to be in Romans chapter 15, verse 16. That I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles, ministering the gospel of God, that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable, being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. Our Heavenly Father, I would like to lift up to you tonight, Brother Al. Lord, we give thanks for this brother, and we pray that you will bless him for his works that he is doing unto you. I pray that you will strengthen him tonight as he is giving a lesson. In Jesus' name I pray, amen. I'd like to start tonight in... Uh just by reading uh, some of Romans chapter 15, uh, just to get a little of the context here. And I would draw our attention to the fact that the the thought actually begins in in verse 8. Verses 1 through 7 are actually a continuation of what Paul was saying in uh, Romans 14. But we're picking up this thought about the Gentiles in in verse 8. So he says, uh, now I say that Jesus Christ was a minister of the circumcision for the truth of God to confirm the promises made unto the fathers and that the Gentiles might glorify God for his mercy. For it is written, for this cause I will confess to thee among the Gentiles and sing unto thy name. And again he saith, rejoice ye Gentiles with his people. And again, praise the Lord, all ye Gentiles, and laud him, all ye people. And again, Isaiah saith, there shall be a root of Jesse, and he that shall rise to reign over the Gentiles, in him shall the Gentiles trust. And then uh, I'm gonna continue on with my, in verse 15 and 16, this is, uh, Nevertheless, brethren, I have written the more boldly unto you in some sort as putting you in mind because of the grace of God that is given to me that I should be the minister of Jesus Christ to the Gentiles ministering the gospel of God that the offering up of the Gentiles might be acceptable being sanctified by the Holy Ghost. I have therefore whereof I may glory through Jesus Christ in those things which pertain to God. And then I want to just uh, allude to this, uh, this, uh, this other uh, word here. In, uh, he said, I, w- I want to just make note of this in, uh, in verse uh, 20 and 21. Yea, I have so strived to preach the gospel, not where Christ was named, lest I should build on another man's foundation, but as it is written, to whom he was spoke not spoken of, they shall see, and they that have not heard shall understand. Now Paul saw, he saw in this prophecy a connection with his own ministry. Now this was primarily, a, this was actually the, the ministry of the Lord Jesus Christ, but this was the ministry of Paul the apostle to the, of the Gentiles. And Paul here in, in Romans 15 is actually making this connection. Not that, the, not that the prophet was prophesying of Paul, but he's making a, cur- a personal connection of his ministry with that prophecy. So I wanted you to draw, draw your attention to that. Now, in, in, uh, by way of introduction, I want to just say that uh, this matter of, of Jews and Gentiles... Uh, we, we that are here, are for the most part, are Gentiles. I don't believe we have any, any of the uh, seed of Abraham according to the flesh. But, uh, you know, we, I think in the process of time, uh, over the years, we, we have become accustomed and used to the thought of being Gentiles and don't see the, the revolutionary nature of the acceptance of the Gentiles. See, now, you never want to let that... Uh, grow old so you want to you always want to keep that alive in your heart how that this is uh this matter of god receiving the gentiles the door of faith being open to the gentiles see this is uh this is a a wonderful thing now let's think about this the kingdom of god is not parochial in other words let, let me just tell you what i mean by that 
And it's not provincial in nature, especially now that uh, sins have been put away by the Lord Jesus Christ. Now, there was a time when, when God used to, you know, he, at the times of ignorance, God winked at. But now he commands all men everywhere to repent. See, so, so now, see, now that now Jesus has ascended up on high when, and, and sins have been put away by him, so now all men are on the same field. See, as far as redemption, he's commanded all men everywhere to repent. Right. All men are on the same field as far as, as far as the objective of this redemption. See, now you've got to see that. Now that which holds sway in one part of this kingdom is the rule and manner of every part. And that which is required in one part is required in every part. And that which is promised to one part is promised to every part. And that which is made accessible to one part is made accessible to every part. See, so it's all, it's, you see how I'm, what, I'm, what I'm saying here. We're talking about the Jews and the Gentiles. Now there's only, there's only uh, three kinds of people in the world, right? There's the Jews and the Gentiles and the Church of God. That's 1 Corinthians 10.32. And uh, we have that delineated for us uh, by, by the Apostle Paul. Now the, uh, the promise of life, which is in Christ Jesus, was not given with respect to certain persons. I just want to, uh, the promise was not given with respect to persons, but it was given respect to faith. The promise was given with respect to faith, where men are believing, where men are believing the promise. The promise is addressed to people that are believing the promise. See what I'm saying? So the... And he... Uh, Said, particularly when one, uh, with, with respect to one's regard for the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. See, now here, now God, wherever, wherever men have a regard for him, God takes notice of that. And God is actually, he's actually involved in the work of, of actually teaching men about his son. So he's, uh, so actually the father and the son are working together in this, uh, in this endeavor. The, the father is teaching men about Christ. And Christ is bringing men to the father. And so, they're, so both of them are working in concert with each other, and the Holy Spirit, of course, is, is effectualizing the work of the Father and the Son. Now, you know, uh, Jesus said, remember in, when he was talking about the sheep, he says, my sheep hear my voice. Remember he talked about there shall be, he th there shall be one fold. Now, that we, we want to give thanks that now there's one fold. Before, there, you know, there was a time when there were two folds. There was a Gentile fold, and there was a Jewish fold, right? But now there's only one fold. Now there's one fold, and there's one shepherd. That's what Jesus said, right? One fold, one shepherd. So that's... Uh, All of Christ's sheep, regardless of the fold they originally came from, have this in common, that they hear his voice. And with regard to the sheep who were formerly Gentile of the Gentile fold, Jesus said, them also I must bring. So just think about now you're here because Jesus said that, right? He said he felt he, he knew that this was, this, was a, this was an assignment that the Father gave him, right? That he says, them also I must bring. I must bring. Okay, so. And then... Uh, Think about this, uh, the Lord Jesus Christ has broken down the middle wall of partition that stood, once stood between the, uh, the Jew and the Gentile, and he's made of the twain one new man. Okay, so, and, and these are things that you already know, right? Nevertheless, lest we become lifted up with pride, we who were in time past Gentiles in the flesh must ever reckon that this middle wall of partition was indeed associated with what we were but praise God, not with what we are in Christ. See, we're, there was at one time a middle wall. You know, you were just, we were just bumping against the wall. You know, we were just not, we were not able to get through, quite frankly. But now the, now the, the middle wall has been broken down. See, so, so now it's just, it's just one fold. One fold and one shepherd, right? And uh, let's think about just a couple other expressions here. Now, I think in Acts 15, 8 and 9, he says he, that God put no difference between us and them. No difference. So, and then in, um, 
Romans chapter 10, 12, uh, 12 and 13, he says, for there is no difference. There is no difference. So I want, to get, want you to get both of these perspectives that there is no difference, and yet uh, we don't want to lose the, the sense of, the, of, the, of the, uh, the preciousness of our being received. You see what I'm saying? From, from one perspective, we were formerly Gentiles, and we were strangers and foreigners, but now we are fellow citizens with the saints. So, so we, want to keep this, we want to keep this perspective alive of what we once were and what we are now. See what I'm saying? So fellow citizens and of the saints and of the household of God. Okay, and then uh, I've got, he said here in Romans <clears throat> that, uh, but now the righteousness of God without the law is manifested, being witnessed by the law and the prophets, even the righteousness of God, which is of God um, by faith in Jesus Christ unto all and upon all them that believe. Them that believe, for there is no difference. So the righteousness is on all them that believe. Don't let anyone take that away from you. The righteousness is on them that believe. If you're believing, this is for you. Amen. See what I'm saying? If you're believing, it's for you. <clears throat> and there is no difference, see? There is no difference. The righteousness is for you if you're believing. <clears throat> Amen. Amen. And, and we've alluded to this before, that uh, this language of the door of faith being open <clears throat> to the Gentiles. Now, just think that one time the door was closed. We were, we were one time we were on, out, on the outside of the door. We were on the outside of the door, but now the door has been opened. The door of faith has been opened to the Gentiles. It's open to us now. Now, we, now see, now we've become accustomed to this. And, and uh, of course, we, there's a sense in which we should become accustomed to it. We, are, we ought to be, uh, you know, we, we, but we don't want to be cu accustomed in the sense of, 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 of pride or being lifted up. See, we want to we become accustomed in the sense that this is, you know, this is where we, this is where we belong. It's become accustomed in that sense. See what I'm saying? All right, and then uh, God has opened the door of faith to the Gentiles. We've said that. All right, so let's think about uh, some things now in, re in connection with our text. Now, Paul, this is uh, Romans, uh, in connection with Romans 15, 15, and 16. Paul was and is a minister to the Gentiles, that is, to the desolate heritages. He was sent to the desolate heritages. Everybody familiar with that in Romans, in, in Isaiah 49? The, 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 he's gonna, Jesus was going to raise up the desolate heritage. God gave Jesus the commission to raise up the desolate heritages. And Paul, Jesus gave Paul the commission. See, he passed that commission largely on to the apostle Paul. You're right. So the father gave it to the son, and the son gave it to Paul. See what I'm saying? And, and largely, uh, the, Paul was... Uh, was, was uh, was given this, given this work to do. Now, you know, Paul had some large, uh, I just want to say this in, in passing, but, you know, in Romans uh, 15, Paul, there's twice that Paul mentions even going to Spain. So he had some large, uh, he's large, not ambitions, but he had some large intentions, large uh, holy intentions of, of going all the way to Spain. But, but that wasn't the will of God. He was, uh, he was put to death at Rome, and he, he didn't make it to Spain, but nevertheless, the gospel, that didn't hinder the gospel. The gospel still got to Spain. See, it was just, it got there with somebody else. See, so we're, we're not, uh, God is not limited by, by things like that. But I just want to think about the desolate heritage. See, that's, what, that's what we all were. That's what we were. We were desolate heritages. Why, why would, you know, if you were going to buy some land or some property, uh, would you want to buy something that's just a desolation? Would you want a, would you want a, like a, the house was desolate and the, and the land was desolate? Would you want, would you, uh, would you in your right mind want to buy something like that? Well, this is what the father was giving to the son. He was giving the son desolate heritages. But, but see now the, the son and the father and the son, they were thinking about this. They were considering this in prospect of what Jesus was going to do. For that they were not going to be desolate anymore. These heritages were not; these ones that were raised up are not going to be desolate anymore. So that was our. That's where we started out as desolate heritages, right? But we're not not desolate anymore. So, desolate of the of the of the knowledge of God and 
and desolate of the, of the, of the, of the promises and desolate of, of everything pertaining to the, to the God of heaven. The father commissioned his son to raise up the, the, the desolate heritage and Christ commissioned Paul, as we've said, as a compensation for raising up the tribes of Jacob and restoring the preserved in Israel, the father promised the son that he would give him for a covenant to the people to establish the earth. How about that language, to establish the earth? He was going to give them to, that was what, what was going to be the result, right? And not only that, to cause to inherit the desolate heritages. Now, how did you think about it? Now, that was, but whatever you think about that, that was appealing to the son. That was actually, that was an incentive for him to go to the cross. But however, so you want to think about that, that, that actually, that actually made, made that, was, that was one of the things that made it worthwhile for Christ to enter into the world and to lay down his life a ransom for many. See, he saw that as an incentive. He saw this is going to make it worthwhile, this, these inheriting these desolate heritages. See, but, but see, what he, was, what, he, what he had in mind was what he was going to, he and the Father were going to make out of them. They weren't going to be desolate anymore. These were going to be, these were going to be glorified. See, they were, going to be, they were going to be sanctified and glorified and justified. And so the Father uh, declared to the Son, I will give thee uh, for a light to the Gentiles that thou mayest be my salvation unto the end of the earth. And the Apostle Paul, being a chosen vessel, chosen from his mother's womb. Now think about this. Now God chose Paul from his mother's womb. Now even on the Damascus road. Now here this one, Jesus found him on the, on the Damascus road, but the father chose him from his mother's womb. So this, wasn't, this was not like an afterthought with the Apostle Paul. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pick this one out who's persecuting my... Now see, so God, see, God knew this all along, that Paul was going to be a persecutor of the church, but, but he, knew that Paul, he knew Paul's heart. He knew what Paul, Paul actually wanted to do. He, he thought he was serving God. He really did. So, but anyhow, uh, he, he, God, God chose him from his mother's womb. It is understood that the exalted Christ was working in and through his apostle every step of the way when, Paul, when he sent Paul to the Gentiles. So. Now in, in Romans 15, 21, Paul affirms that he sees this, his calling as an apostle uh, of the Lord Jesus Christ as a part of the fulfillment of the prophecies such as Isaiah 52, 15 and 65, 1. Now that's what we already mentioned, that to whom he was... He was not, to whom they were uh, not, uh, let me just get the, vocab the, the words right here. The, uh, to whom he was not spoken of, they shall see. Now that, that, those, uh, those references that I just gave you are, are alluding to where, where Paul was quoting from. Now th let's think about the commission that was given to Paul here. Uh, he said to open their eyes and to turn them from darkness to light, from the power of Satan unto God, and that they may re receive forgiveness of sins and inheritance among them which are sanctified by faith that is in me. I'll just tell you, that's a wonderful declaration. This faith that is in me, faith that is in me. Jesus talking to, the, to Paul on the, from the, you know, on the Damascus road, he said they're going to be sanctified by faith that is in me. So, so and incidentally, I just want to bring in the, this thought that Brother Given had uh, mentioned a, a couple months ago in the New Covenant series, but this matter of, of faith, the new, the new Covenant, faith in the New Covenant, this is uh, when Jesus ascended up on high, this actually inducted the era of living by faith. When he was out of sight, See, that now, see, that our faith is in Christ, see? When he was here in the world, see, we, we you know, the, see, can you see what I'm saying? But w when he was in the world, men were not living by, by faith. Uh, they believed what he said, but they were not li living by faith like we are in, the, in, the, in these last days. See, they, now we're living, uh, 
The just shall live by faith. But this era began when, when Jesus ascended up on high. Now the entrance of sin into the world set the stage for the indispensable need for sanctification if men are to be reconciled back to God. Even immediately after the expulsion from Eden and after the flood and after the Tower of Babel, after the, the, the absolute necessity of sanctification is once and again highlighted. So it's just the need for, the need for sanctification. In the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, God is not purposing to take possession of your possessions. He is purposing to take possession of you. So, uh, so, um, and he is someday going to burn up all your possessions. So, and, and my possessions. So, uh, but let's think about this. Now, our possessions, we may think, well, then, then they must not be important, but, but they are important. See, it, see, God is actually using our possessions as, as a means of sanctifying us. See, it's like, how, what are we doing with our possessions? See, it's, it's like our affections are involved and our, you know, and how, you know, our uh, choices and values and things like this. So they, this actually is, is, has a ministry of, of perfecting us and in, in, a, in the work of sanctification. Can you see that? What if you didn't have any possessions? What if you had owned zero except for the, the you know, like the, the square foot that you stand on or something like that? You see what I mean how that this would be, well, that's just a, but, but you see, but the matter, the, the fact that you have possessions, see, that's, that's, see, now that introduces the need for judging and assessing and having the proper value of things, you know, and uh, making the right choices. Amen. Now, um, in the redemption that's in Christ Jesus, uh, God is not purposing to take possession of your possessions, as we said, Sanctification being an indispensable aspect of salvation is a work in which the entire Godhead is engaged. I think these are some of the things, these are things that we're already familiar with, but let's just talk about this. Uh, so foundational to this consideration is that God is holy. The one who kills and makes alive is holy. The one who resists the proud and raises up the beggar from the dunghill is holy. His foundation is in the holy mountains, the angelic beings who dwell in the presence, uh, his presence walk continually in the lively awareness of his holiness. The Father sanctified the Son and sent him into the world in order to the accomplishment of the redemption that is in, that is in him, the Lord Jesus Christ him sanctified himself. I'm going to, I think I'm going to skip down uh, over some of this because I'm going to get, I'm just going to get to more of what my text is about here. So let's, let's think about uh, some facets of sanctification. I want to think, I want us to think about uh, God blessed and he sanctified the Sabbath day. Think about that. Now God blessed and sanctified his son and sent him into the world. Is that, is that the same thing? Are we talking about the same thing there? It's not the same thing, is it? But it's the same kind of thing. It's, uh, so in the first instance, he sanctified the Sabbath day, but this was like, a, like a, he was introducing a foundational thought. See, this was, uh, he was, see, when God sanctified the Sabbath day and set it apart, he was teaching men about sanctification and what was involved in setting things apart. See, now here we, so, uh, but he, uh, sanctified the prophets like Jeremiah. He sanctified his son, sent him into the world. He sanctifies his people, his elect. He sanctifies his brethren, even those who have faith in him. The father and the son are a sanctuary for men. Uh, Christ sanctified himself in order that his people might be sanctified through the truth. The Holy Spirit sanctifies God's elect or Christ's brethren. And men are sanctified by faith that is in Christ. The sanctified ones are the recipients of spiritual vision, forgiveness of sins, and the eternal inheritance. Now the objects of sanctification in the new covenant in the time and the uh, in the new covenant in the time of uh, 
Moses and the prophets, sundry objects such as uh, and beast were sanctified as a shadow of heavenly things. The tabernacle and the furniture of the tabernacle were said to be sanctified. Aaron and his sons were sanctified by Moses. But all these were a shadow of, of a better thing that was to come. But I want to just make this a comment here about the shadow that in those early times when the, only the shadow existed, see, God treated the shadow as though it were the substance. I mean, if, if anyone violated the, the shadow, God treated it just as though it were the substance. You know, like, like uh, when, when Uzzah reached up and touched the ark. See, that was a, he, was, he was violating a shadow. Or You, you see what I'm saying? Now, you, there's numerous occasions back there in Moses and the prophets where the, there were, where the shadow was violated and God dealt with men very severely because the shadow was pointing to Christ. See, and that... In the New Covenant, God is not setting apart tangible objects and beasts unto himself, but rather sanctifying men and women for his own possession and use. In the salvation that's in Christ Jesus, God is not purposing to take ownership of your possessions, but rather of you, and we've said that already. If I could speak bluntly, God really doesn't want your stuff. God really doesn't want your money. I don't know how many places where you would hear that preached, but... But God really isn't interested in your money. He's not really interested in your possessions. I mean, primarily, primarily. See, he's interested in you. But, you're, but see, your money and your possessions, see, become, see, they, your relationship and your stewardship of your money are actually part of the, facilitate part of this work of sanctification. You know, the, your, you see what I'm saying? So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to just, uh, I'm going to illustrate this a little bit more. Let's think about the offering uh, for the poor saints of Jerusalem that was brought by them, uh, uh, brought by the Apostle Paul from distant lands, from, from mostly Gentile brethren that lived hundreds of miles away. Now, from the heavenly perspective, what do you suppose captured the primary attention of the principalities and powers? Were they, looking, were they just keeping track of where the money was? Where's the bag? Is it at, is it at Corinth now? Or, or, or is it at, where is it at Rome? Where's, where the, were the angels looking on? Were they saying, well, where's the bag now? So, or were they looking at men's hearts? Or were they looking at how that men were giving? Men were, men were giving and they were opening their hearts uh, to, to, to give to the, the, the poor saints at Jerusalem. Can you see what I mean? Those are the kinds of, those are the kinds of things they were paying attention to. Were they observing things like the diligent urging of the apostle, the bountifulness of the givers, or the, and the thankfulness of the recipients? This is a, a this is you know this is a an, a perspective of giving and receiving that's that's not really thought about very much today. That you know we like when we take offerings and things like this. You know think about. Remember, you know, the, you know, think about angels and principalities and powers looking on. And, and uh, I'm not, we're not trying to scare you into gi to giving in, in a real subtle way. That isn't, that's not my purpose. But see, can you see what I'm saying? This is, a, this, see, there's, there's more involved here in this matter of, of these sort of things than just, you know, just what's, what's, what's offered up. The significance of the offering up of the Gentiles being sanctified by the Holy Ghost seems to derive from the fact that at this particular time, the acceptance of the Gentiles on a large scale into the household of faith was relative, a relatively new thing in the first century. Now, that's, uh, now th this offering up of the Gentiles, I, 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 see, I, I, I don't think he was talking about the money itself. It, seem, it seems like he's talking about the people, the people that were doing the offering. This, the, the offering up is the point here, the offering up of the Gentiles, the sacrifice that they were making in this, in this matter. It was, we're talking about the hearts of people more than we are the, 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 uh, the offering itself. And I wanna, want us to think about this uh, 
The Apostle Paul labored by word and deed, he says, to make the Gentiles obedient, as he said that their professed subjection to the gospel of Christ would indeed prove to be acceptable to God. And this is not uh, speaking of a special standard uh, that was being set for the Gentiles in contrast with the Jews, but rather Paul did not take for granted that they would, that the Gentiles would be accepted of God. He labored diligently, teaching and admonishing them to the end that they would be accepted of him. Now this is a, con this is a view that is uh, largely lost in the church today, that about ministers laboring to the end that those that sit under their preaching would be, that their offering up would be indeed be accepted of God. You see what I'm saying? We, in other words, that there would be, there would be completeness there would be completeness in the, there would be perfection of heart among the, among the hearers, you know, that these, that these people would be in the, indeed be accepted of God. Their offerings would be accepted of God. And one of the objectives of God's salvation in Christ, redeemed men are being incorporated into the Godhead. So this, uh, I want us to think about this, that, you know, we were, uh, we, were, we were baptized into Christ. We were baptized into his death. We were baptized into the name, the, the American standard says, into the name, into the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. And we're growing up into Christ in all things. So here, so here this, but this matter of the, uh, of this induction into Christ and continuing in Christ. And I, I, have, uh, I have several references here, but you know what, I think I'm going to, to just stop there because I've made my point. You know, this was, a, this was a, a kind of a difficult text to deal with, it was different. And uh, I'm thankful that I had it, but it was just, uh, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna try to say anymore because I, I think uh, that's, that's about what I'm going to say. <laughs> How about that for an answer? So. <laughs>